Let's talk about inflammation. Not sure if you ever looked at what inflammation really is. Is it just like swelling of blood? Is it a concentration of immune cells? Is that what inflammation is? Or maybe it's just free radicals that are creating kind of a fire in your body. And why does inflammation lead to cancer and insulin resistance? And why does it go from an acute phase to a chronic phase where it can basically last your whole life? That's weird. So let's talk about that. So there's two things involved with inflammation. One is an infection and two is an injury, okay? Now, both of those responses are being influenced by your immune system. And so the immune system is activated and does the work for both an infection and an injury. Now, you wouldn't think the immune system is what comes in there and does the magic with injuries, but it does. There's a repair action where the cells have to clean up all the debris. Well, those are immune cells, macrophages that are coming up and eating up all the debris. And then you have other cells that are laying down collagen and proteins to help heal the damaged tissue. Now, with an infection, it's a little bit different because you have two things going on. You have the containment and fighting off and killing an infection, a pathogen. And then you have to clean up all the debris that occurs from the weapons that your immune system has used against this pathogen. And so you have a lot more involved when you have an infection. Not to mention you also have a fever involved as well, whereas an injury, you don't typically have a fever. Now with infection, especially viruses, um, they can kind of go into a dormant state. It's called a latent phase. And so after this infection, you feel better, everything is resolved, then it can actually come back years later in the form of chronic fatigue syndrome or even chronic inflammatory type problems. Now with an injury, depending on the severity of it, you also have scar tissue involved. Uh, like for example, my neck, I've had a lot of injuries with my neck, uh, motorcycle accidents, resting injuries, a lot of scar tissue and arthritis. So with that comes a lot of inflammation, especially if I don't keep my neck in a state of motion. And then you also have other injuries too in your digestive tract, which involves certain foods that we eat, like gluten, junk foods, things like that, and also damage in our lungs, okay, and the inside of the arteries from smoke, vaping, etc. And that can develop into scar tissue and all sorts of issues like uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD. And each organ or tissue has its own capacity to repair. For example, the liver that gets hammered with all these toxins can repair very, very robustly. In fact, it has a huge capacity to repair and the cells can actually come back to normal. And of course, there's a point of limitation where you could bring it too far. But when we get into ligaments and tendons, that don't have a good blood supply, uh, they tend to heal with scar tissue. And even your muscles, like the heart tissue, can heal with scar tissue because it doesn't have the capacity of healing like your liver does. There is something very interesting about inflammation that I'm going to bring up. This one factor that is going to also give us a nice solution for inflammation. And this involves oxygen. So what happens when we have inflammation, especially with an injury, um, we have this initial edema, this swelling, right? We have this initial blood and oxygen infusion to the area, but then as the edema settles in, we actually get a drop in oxygen, okay? And this drop in oxygen in areas of inflammation is called hypoxia. Hypoxia is a lowered oxygen condition. Hypoxia is a condition that is controlled by certain sensors in your body that are influenced by the level of oxygen in your tissues. And one of the triggers for hypoxia is inflammation. So inflammation causes hypoxia, and hypoxia can cause inflammation. So you have this closed loop situation going round and round, and this is where it can turn into chronic inflammation. Anyone with chronic inflammation regardless of if it's in a joint or anywhere in your body, um, has this hypoxic situation going on. And this hypoxia situation is fueling and causing more inflammation. Now, at the cellular level, okay, we're talking about the, the mitochondria. The mitochondria is at the heart of making energy. It has a certain thing called respiration. So it breathes. 
that metabolism requires oxygen, okay? Just like a motor, just like an engine needs oxygen. This chain reaction thing that occurs that turns fuel into energy, called ATP. And very simply, there's a lot of chemical names involved in biochemistry, but there's just these four steps that occur. And then the last step, which is the fourth step, it involves oxygen, okay? And then oxygen is there to accept electrons. Now think about electrons from the viewpoint of a battery, okay? We're, we're basically generating energy, and that final energy that's used by the body, called ATP, has uh, all these different um, electrons that are kind of storing energy. And then oxygen is needed to accept the electrons to make things very, very stable. And so if there is a problem in the mitochondria, okay, with this machinery, um, the oxygen is not accepting all of these electrons. And what results from that is something very unstable, something very reactive. And you may have heard of it. It's called ROS, R-O-S. I'm not going to get into the woods with that, but just realize that ROS is different forms of very unstable uh, oxygen compounds that create a lot of destruction in your body. But realize if there's damage to the mitochondria, you're going to have hypoxia. You're going to have unstable oxygen compounds that are going to create even more damage at the cellular level. And this is why we have antioxidants to help balance that. And so all these antioxidants help balance these free radicals that are creating a lot of uh, damage. But if we don't have enough antioxidants and we have too much of this ROS, then we get what's called oxidative stress. And so you can imagine in chronic inflammatory conditions, you have a lot of this ROS, a lot of these damaged mitochondria, and a great susceptibility to getting cancer and also insulin resistance and diabetes. In fact, many of the diseases out there are related to dysfunctional mitochondria. So how can we use this information to get rid of the inflammation? Well, what we want to do is we want to supply oxygen to our bodies, okay? And also, by the way, anything that improves the mitochondria will improve oxygen. And anything that improves inflammation will improve your mitochondria as well as increasing oxygen. So let's go to the list, okay? Number one, okay, and this is like really important, exercise. Exercise floods your body with more oxygen, especially regular aerobic exercise, really amazing for inflammation, as well as improving your mitochondria and hypoxic states. And especially exercise into the areas of your body where you have inflammation. Of course, I'm not talking about acute inflammation, but chronic inflammation. So I have a lot of inflammation in my neck, my mid-back, and my lower back. So I am constantly doing exercises to force oxygen into those areas. Now, number two, if we look at the mitochondria and what's happening when we have damage to the mitochondria, we have this hypoxic state, is there anything we can take to improve that? And the answer is yes. And that is called methylene blue. I did a whole video on it and it's fascinating. And I'll put that link down below so you can um, learn more about that. Number three, the hyperbaric oxygen chamber. I've done this before. It's fantastic. It infuses a lot of oxygen into the body, and it's great for um, certain types uh, of repair, like after a stroke where you have this hypoxic uh, ischemic brain damage, or even after a heart attack where you're trying to put more oxygen into the heart tissue, or even if you have a chronic infection and you want to see super fast healing. All right, next one, nose breathing, okay, especially when you're sleeping. When you nose breathe, you actually restrict your air, you increase more CO2, which allows more oxygen to penetrate deep in your cells. All right, next one, infrared. Infrared therapy. I mean, you can just buy a, a fairly inexpensive unit online and use that to decrease inflammation directly and thereby increasing oxygen and lowering hypoxic states in your body. All right, next one is fasting. Fasting is the most potent action to decrease inflammation out of anything you can do. And fasting increases oxygen. If you've never done fasting, I would start with intermittent fasting and then graduate into prolonged fasting. All right, next one. This is vitamin D. Vitamin D, out of all the nutrients, is the most potent anti-inflammatory. This is why just getting a lot of sun in the summer is very therapeutic. 
Now, next one might sound very counterintuitive, but it's high altitude training. Now, you can do this by um, what's called hypoxic training, where you're restricting your air, but you can also do it um, by training in higher altitudes. Now, of course, you have to work up to it, but here's the interesting thing about this. There's actually something called mountain sickness, where you actually get edema and sick when you're in high altitudes if you climb too high because the air is very thin and there's very low amounts of oxygen. But if you don't go that high and you train maybe, I don't know, two or 3,000 feet above sea level and you do that intermittently so it's not too frequent or too long, your body will adapt and make bigger red blood cells getting more oxygen. Next one, massage and body work to the areas where you have inflammation. What is that going to do? It's going to manipulate the edema and swelling and infuse oxygen into that area that is not healing and the inflammation will definitely go down. So any therapy that increases circulation into the area will help reduce inflammation and increase CO2. All right, next one, ozone therapy. Um, You have to go to certain doctors that use it, but it is a very powerful way of increasing oxygen deep into the tissues of your body. Now, if you're anemic, that can decrease oxygen systemically. So preventing anemia, whether it's taking iron or B12 or folate, is very, very important. Also, coenzyme Q10 is another really good nutrient to help your mitochondria and increase oxygen because it's part of the machine in creating ATP. Now, this next one is a combination of um, like a, a sauna or a hot tub, and then cold therapy too, maybe jumping into an ice bath, something like that, back and forth. What is that going to do? That is going to create some serious circulation and drop inflammation very fast and infuse a lot of oxygen. And then consuming antioxidants from a healthy diet is very, very important, which brings us to things that you want to avoid as well. Of course, like the omega-6 fatty acids, taking more omega-3 fatty acids can help balance your oxygen levels. Avoiding smoking, secondary smoke, vaping, okay? Vaping has been known to create serious problems in the inside of your arteries as well as your lungs. And if you're trying to be fit and you're exercising and you're vaping or smoking, boy, that's going to set you back. And of course, you have the obvious things, or maybe obvious to me, like eating foods with gluten that can create a constant irritation or inflammation, whether it's a food allergy or just eating foods high in omega-6 fatty acids like grains, that can create inflammation. And of course, the more sugar you have flowing through your arteries, the more hypoxia you're going to develop, the more scar tissue you're going to develop, and the more inflammation you're going to have. Now, I've given you a lot of things to do uh, related to inflammation, but if you have not seen my other video on inflammation that was very popular, I'm going to put it up right here. Check it out.